Okay, uh, thank you for the invitation to speak. Uh, so this project actually grew out of trying to verify a condition in one of Artin's theorems, um, but uh, that's not where the Artin approximation comes in that I'll talk about today, but uh, it sort of appears at the end, so you'll have to bear with me for a while. Um, okay, but uh, so I certainly wasn't familiar with anything about Tanaka duality when I started this project, so I won't assume you are either. Um, so we'll uh, start slow. All right, so we're going to let G be a finite group. Okay, then you can do this just like with uh, vector spaces. It's a dual group, which is just a space of group, sort of group homomorphisms from G to the non-zero complex numbers, okay? Uh, G hat is finite and abelian, okay? So there's a, a very baby case of the Planck-Roll theorem, right? Is the following. I don't know who did this, but it's pretty old, I assume. G is abelian, then, well, you can look at the group homomorphisms, ah, G and H are abelian. You can look at the set of group homomorphisms between G and H, right, and then you can map this to there's also the set of group homomorphisms between their dual in the other way. And there's a map between them, okay? Just by, if you have a map of groups, then you can get a map between their characters, okay. just by composition. And the theorem is that this is bijective, okay? All right, so what if G is not a billion? All right, well, things start to get a bit sad with the dual group then. Uh, so uh, basically what happens if you have any finite group, you have a character, then chi will always vanish on the commutator. Okay? So what we see pretty quickly is that the dual of G is the same as the dual of its abelianization. Okay. All right, so basically what all this is really telling us is that um, in the non-abelian case, we can't get much information from characters, from the dual group. Okay. But we like non-abelian groups, so we should try to do something about it. All right, so, I mean, what was G hat really? All it was was, a better way of looking at it was uh, linear actions of G on a one-dimensional vector space, okay? So the, I guess, obvious generalization uh, maybe not so obvious, but uh, Instead of, instead of it's looking at actions on one-dimensional things, we can look at actions on any dimensional vector space. 
All right, so we're going to let rep G be C linear actions of G on C vector spaces. Okay, so I've given you the objects and I want the maps to be G equivariant. Linear maps. Okay. So you could ask a similar, you could ask the following question. So if you've got an equivalence between the categories of representations of G and H, does that imply these are the same group? Unfortunately, if you phrase it this way, the answer is no. Because, well, if you just look at representations of the cyclic group of order four, you can make this the same as the representations of this guy. Right, so these are the same as abelian categories, basically. In particular, they're the same as sort of isomorphism classes. So you need to. I mean, basically, the thing is, is that uh, w there's more structure here, and we want to preserve it. Right? And this is what Tanaka realized. So Tanaka realized in the 30s uh, that there is more more structure. And uh, we should keep it. OK, so, well, what is the structure? Well, the basic thing is that this category looks a lot like the category of vector spaces. OK, so that was his sort of key insight, which so. Uh, Basically, rep G is a lot like vect, okay, which I'm calling vector spaces. So I mean that in the following ways. Maps have kernel and images. So if you... This more or less means that the, it's abelian. It's an abelian category. A bit more interesting here is that you can tensor objects together. OK, so you can, you've got two representations. You can tensor them together. So this is called a monoidal structure. Okay. And then the last one, which is a bit weird, is that there's this thing called the fiber functor, and that just forgets the vector, the, the group action. Okay, so I mean, somehow what's uh, very clever about this is that uh, sort of G hat had an obvious structure in that it was a group, but this was just a category, so there's no obvious thing that you should think of that would preserve things, right? Um, but Tanaka realized that this is a good one, and you can sort of make it precise. All right, so which ones do we want to? Okay. 
So you can make it precise in that this is a good, a good bunch of information to remember. And this is a, a basic case of Tanaka's theorem. which is the following. So this isn't exactly what Tanaka proved, but it's a very easy consequence, and it's uh, more useful for what I want to talk about later. Um, so it may not be exactly the Tanaka thing. If you're familiar with Tanaka duality, this might look a bit funny. Okay. All right, so as before, um, we've got the set of maps between H and G, group homomorphisms. Then on the other side, well, we're going to have rep G and rep H. Okay, but then when I, I'm going to want to have functors between here, but I want them to preserve some stuff, right? So I want it to preserve the tensor functor, the tensor product, and the forgetful functor. Okay? So there's a map like that, right? So this is just right because if you have a group acting on a vector space um, and you have a map from H to G, then you can precompose it and you get an action of H on that vector space and you didn't mess with the vector space. That's what the fiber functor says. Okay? And Tanaka's is but that's bijective. Okay, so I would say, uh, I mean, Tanaka actually proved more than this. He didn't just do it for finite groups, he did it for compact topological groups. And uh, I guess in the 60s and 70s, Delene, you can even do it for affine algebraic groups. Okay? Yeah, affine. Affine, affine algebraic. Okay. All right, so now I want to talk about so this was all, yeah. 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 Yes, that's the tensor is the group yeah. product. Yes. Yep. Um, all right. Okay. So. A bit later, so in the 60s, uh, Gabriel, I guess, I think this was on his th in his thesis, but uh, I want to talk about some other results that have a similar flavor. Okay, so I'm going to, Gabriel's theorem was much more general than this. I'm just going to talk about a basic case. Um, all right, so we start with a subvariety of projective n space. And what we can do, algebraic, so there's no confusion here. Now, what we can look at is. we can look at vectex, which is going to be algebraic vector bundles on X. Okay, so I just mean it's a risky locally, they look like affine space. So, So sort of what we've got is we've got to some object, we've got some associated sort of linear, object of linear things. So you can ask if these things determinate. So if you have an equivalence between the categories of vector bundles, does that imply that 
x is the same as y. And that's what Gabriel proved. Well, he did prove other things, but this is a consequence. Well, the answer is yes, and I'm pretty sure it was Gabriel proved this. Uh, you can even do better, okay, which is that Uh, you can even say what this equivalence comes from. So let's give that a, a letter. Okay. And there exists a unique isomorphism from y to x such that f if you evaluate it on a vector bundle, is the same as pulling back along that morphism and then tensoring it by F on the structure sheaf. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do this now. Can you do them at once? <laughs> what? Oh, that's true. Right, and then I'll take. Ah, is that all right? Oh, wait, okay. Okay. All right, so. Now, what's sort of interesting about this is that uh, nowadays some people like to think of representations of a group as vector bundles on some geometric object. All right? So or some sort of... Uh, on something that... I'll put it in quotation marks for now, because depending on who you are, uh, you might have a different version of what that thing should be. But uh, to me, because I'm an algebraic geometer, BG is a special kind of algebraic stack. Okay. So then, uh, all right, so I'm going to talk briefly about these. I'm not going to say what they are, um, but I'm just going to sort of tell you some basic things about them. All right, so I mean, really, what these are isn't so important, but uh, I mean, I just sort of want to give some examples of what they do. So the basic idea is that an algebraic stack is a sort of a funny object which is algebraic enough to be able to do algebraic geometry on it. So there's, you know, there's sheaves and there's a Zariski uh, topology, a tile topology, all these sorts of things. So lots of things that you would be familiar from, from you know, usual sort of algebraic geometry, um, either carry over or someone is trying or has given up on carrying it over. <laughs> so, uh, so what's nice about them uh, is they're a really sort of a natural place to do moduli theory and equivariant algebraic geometry. So just some examples. Um, so, so every variety or scheme is an algebraic stack. Okay. Uh, and as I mentioned up here, if G is an algebraic group, then there is 
BG uh, and the vector bundles on BG are the same as the representations of G. So now what you can do is you can combine them. So if G acts on X, yeah, it's an algebraic one, yeah. Um, so if you have a group acting on a variety, algebraic group, and that's a you know acting on a variety or scheme, then. There is, I'll come over here now, x mod g, okay, uh, and it is an algebraic stack, and what's great about it is, well, it's the space of, it's a way of looking at g orbits, but it has the following nice property, which is that its vector bundles are the same as the G equivariant vector bundles on X. Okay. Right, so this is uh, what usually call some sort of uh, quotient stack is a loaded word, but uh, that should be one of them. Uh, all right. So, but there are lots more. Um, coming from moduli theory. Okay, so... So in case you have a, a good action, like you do the fine finger, then this stack is, is the, the, the normal quotient? It'd have to be a free action. But yeah, if it's free, sure. Um, okay, so and uh, so th these ones coming from moduli theory, um, it's not uh, uh, often. They're not or. You don't know. They are quotient stacks. They look like that. Okay, so uh, I mean, there's a good reason for this. Uh, yeah, that's true. So one of them is that. Uh, the, probably the, the sort of the most surefire way how to make an algebraic stack is using this thing called Artin's criteria, right? So I mean, I wouldn't write down these lists of conditions, but the the basic idea is that if you have some sort of algebraic moduli problem, you know, some sort of uh, you know, curves, surfaces uh, with, you know, uh, line bundles on them, all sorts of algebraic sorts of things you might want to uh, parameterize. Then what you can do is, if it has some reasonable conditions, You can feed it into Artin's criteria, and it spits out an algebraic stack. OK, 
Okay, so the good thing about this process is that it almost always works. Uh, the, the unfortunate thing about it is that because it always works, you don't know what you get out the other side. Okay, so basically, when you're dealing with algebraic stacks, that means that you probably can't assume too much about it. In particular, assuming this, well, it's hard to tell. Do we allow these stacks to be infinite dimensional? Uh, no. Um, no. Um, okay, so. All right. All right, but uh, yeah, I guess David will. Uh, what I'll talk, what I'll get to soon. David will uh, talk about some of that some more. Okay, so I had some other. Okay. Uh, maybe we'll go over here. All right. So now. It now seems like a rather natural thing to do is to try to combine uh, Gabriel's theorem, which was about vector bundles on a quasi-projective variety, and Tanaka's theorem, which was about sort of vector bundles on BG. Right. So, but they're you know they're they're written a bit differently, right? So we'll just write a little list here. Um, Okay, so if we see with, with Gabriel, there was no tensor product. All right, we didn't have to do anything with a tensor product. But we knew that for, for groups with BGs, for instance, there was nothing we could do about that. We had to remember the tensor product. So I'll put a straight face there. Um, and same with Tanaka. There's really not much we can do about that. Okay. Um, now... What was really neat about Gabriel was there was no fiber functor, right? So I think that's a that's a big positive. Uh, and uh, with Tanaka, there was a fiber functor, and so I mean uh, somehow from a from a representation theory perspective, having a fiber functor is probably not a weird thing, right? You're just making sure your functors don't mangle your vector spaces, right? But from the geometric perspective, if you look at what a fiber functor is telling you, it's telling you to sort of uh, send maps through a cover, right? Which is not the sort of thing that you would be worried about doing that. Maps don't like factoring through covers, okay? So what the problem, the, the annoying thing about Gabriel is it can only handle equivalences, right? We had to have an equivalence of the vector bundles to say we had an equivalence of the varieties, right? So that was not so good. But what was really great about Tanaka is that they had all maps, right? So particularly if you're looking at varieties, you would really like to be able to know all maps between your varieties, not just equivalences. Okay, so. All right, so we can make a new question. And this is not my question. Does determine an algebraic stack X? Okay. Now, sorry. 
Oh, we can ten take tensor product of vector bundles. No, all I, all I meant was that, sorry, with Gabriel, I just meant that it didn't, the equivalence didn't have to preserve the tensor product. What was that? Okay. But you, you see yeah, because we know we need it for, for BG. Right? We have to. Okay, so unfortunately, um, on stacks, uh, having lots of vector bundles is, or well, even on general schemes, is a, it's a bit. Uh, well, you can't really be sure that's going to happen. So what you have to end up doing is you replace this by the coherent sheaves. Uh, and uh, I won't really say what they are, but they're just sort of like vector bundles, but the ranks can jump. Okay. So And then basically phrased this way, this was uh, more or less in a paper, a preprint, which was never published by Lurie uh, about 10 years ago. Okay, so, all right, so, uh, now, unfortunately, this doesn't exactly work. Okay, because... Uh, Quasi-rejective, well, yeah. In fact, Gabriel proved it for uh, Noetherian schemes, for coherent sheaves on Noetherian schemes. Yeah. Um, okay. So if uh, if you take an elliptic curve, okay, over complex numbers. Then uh, this is an algebraic group, okay? So we can make BE is an algebraic stack. And if we looked at, well, vector bundles and coherent sheaves agree on this. That's not such a big deal. But as I said in the example up there, this is the same as representations of E, okay? but uh, elliptic curves don't like having characters, right? There's, there's only trivial ones. Okay? So what you see is that uh, uh, question is false for BE. Okay? But uh, what David and I did was if you basically rule out all those examples, then you're in good shape. Okay, so what we prove So you've got uh, maps between two stacks. And you've got the monoidal functors, the functors between the coherent sheaves that preserve the tensor product. And there's a map. Okay, so you take a map. And this goes to its pullback. Okay. Then this is an equivalence. We need some hypotheses. Uh, so if X is no theorem. So with affine stabilizers, this just basically means you can't have something like this appearing, okay? And actually, there's the anti-affine group schemes too, which it gets rid of. Um, 
And the last thing is what I'm going to spend the last little bit talking about is you need T excellent. Uh, maybe I should write this another way. Uh, uh, what's the best way to say this? I want to say this excellent. I just mean that, uh, say, T is a, um, should look like the spectrum of an excellent Noetherian ring. Okay. Yeah, uh, but the T, T can be a stack too, but. Uh, Yeah, we'll say it's uh, locally. This is actually a... <laughs> okay, so maybe I'll just briefly talk about what some other people did. So what Lurie proved was Lurie proved something a bit weaker. Um, but it was uh, good enough for what he wanted. Um, and uh, probably the, the closest sort of analogy to this that it was been before was there was a result for, uh, for schemes. You can even do non Noetherian. Uh, was uh, Brandenburg and Chivasi too. I guess this was in probably 2011, right? Okay. So yeah, all right. So we'll uh, we'll come back to back to that in a little bit more. But uh, so some, right, so some of the applications well, so uh, David will talk about one of them. And another one, which was actually the original motivation, which was uh, of algebraicity palm stacks. Okay, so uh, this is about uh, if you've got two algebraic stacks, you want to look at the space of maps between them, and uh, you would like that to be still algebraic. Okay, so um, and this what this dealt with was um, I'd say Lurie had known it in the case of affine diagonal, but uh, what, what we did is we were able to get it to affine stabilizers. Okay. okay. So now I'm going to talk. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's the only thing you need to preserve. All right. All right, so now I'm just going to talk about where excellence comes in. Uh, well, it's no theory, and I guess, so... Dimension... No? Nope. Okay, so... Okay. All right. So, so where does the excellence come in? 
All right, so I'm going to briefly talk about there's this uh, May of a torus squares. Okay, so open. Okay, so we're going to look at a diagram like this. Of schemes, okay, and that map's going to be affine and flat. Okay, so this is what is called a flat. I have a torus square. Okay, so I mean, this looks uh, scarier than it than, than it uh, really needs to be. I mean, some basic examples are if you say just take um, Which bit? Which one? Oh, yes. <laughs> Sorry. And say, uh, complement of U, uh, P is an isomorphism. Okay. Sorry. Yes. So uh, a basic case, which is probably uh, more familiar from topology, which is, I guess, where the name comes from, which is that uh, which way? Uh, hang on, I'm getting confused here. Sorry? In T, yes. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, there is no, no one structure. There's a structure. You mean the reduced component? Uh, yeah. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, yes. Okay. Yes, I'm doing a bad job of presenting Laurent's paper here. <laughs> um, okay, so this is, uh, this is sort of one sort of more familiar example where you have sort of two opens, their intersection and their union. But uh, some more interesting ones Uh, when you take, say, a uh, spec, you just take a ring, you localize at an element like this, and you take the completion, so the f attic completion up here. Let's call this U prime. Okay. And the one that we'll, that we'll be really interested in is sort of a souped up version of this, which is where we have um, an open okay, and then the we take the completion, so this is like 
this. Okay, so this is the one that we'll need to remember. All right. So there's this nice result. Which uh, Moray Bay proved. And it generalizes uh, He proved it. it was nicer, but uh, this is a special case of it. And it generalizes some well-known sort of things by uh, Artin, uh, Ferron, Renu, and Bobo Laszlo, which is the following. It says that if you've got coherent sheaves on T, on Omeo Vitoris square, you can look at their pullback to be open you can sort of, if you've got a coherent sheaf here you can sort of pull it round to here and get an isomorphism up on U prime and the theorem is that that's an equivalence That's uh, you can glue coherent sheaves on Mayavatora squares. Okay, so now if we start, uh, uh, what's a good board to use? Yeah, okay. And then these closed sets are normal. Okay. Yeah, I guess it's flat, right? So. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah, you start with the closed subset. Don't remember? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the flatness, I think. Yeah, okay, yeah, but that's not... I'm, I'm not sure I remember the assumption All right, so if we uh, so if we start feeding that equivalence into what this thing is supposed to say, right, then we start seeing something. So let's just write this out. Okay, so then we come down here. Over here, I'm going to run out of room. Okay, so.
All right, so what do we have here? Okay, so we've got all of these. We've got this diagram. And uh, this is the one we don't know. That's what we're trying to prove. Uh, and uh, the theorem up there. Yeah, but it's always it's a, it's always local on T. Um, yeah, it's just descent on T. Yeah. All right. So what the Amara Bayes thing shows is that this one is an equivalence. Okay. Now. What uh, David and I do by some uh, cutting and pasting and thickening and whatnot is show that there's some inductive process that lets us assume that we're in the situation where that's an equivalence. Okay, so if we want that to be an equivalence, then that one better be an equivalence. Okay, so if we unravel what that says, that says that. Should be uh, co Cartesian. And stacks with our fine stabilizers. Okay. All right. And uh, The answer hmm? uh, it's an alpha and flat. Which one? Start with T. Yeah, that's part of the induction. And so it'll yeah. So you take the you take a you basically take a big open of X where it's a where it's a it has a where it's a nice global quotient, and then the complement is not so nice, but that's a close. You can pull that back. That gives you something on T, which to which you complete along, and that gives you your T prime. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, which is I'm right the way and uh, all right so uh, it is and T is excellent okay so uh, Murray Bay did it with uh, stacks with separated diagonal um, and uh, what we did was we were able to get rid of this, the separateness hypothesis. Okay, so I still haven't said where aren't an approximation come in yet. So that's when you look up how this is proved. I'm not going to prove this, but it's just sort of a sort of a bunch of steps. So the hardest one. Is that uh, is this one? Okay. Somehow that has to use the full force of the paper and requires a different formulation of the initial problem to make it work out, which I was sweeping under the rug. But uh, normally this is the easy case, but this is the hard one in this time. Okay. But then after this, you can start sort of playing games with it, which is the usual thing. Flat then it's okay now. Okay. Because flat locally these things admit sections and then you're in business. 
Then the next one is so a little less common. If you can write T prime as a limit, where T lambda to T is affine flat and a finite presentation, then you're OK. All right. So now you hit this over the head with Neuron Popescu. Right? Then you're okay. And then the last one is that, uh, which is just checking that if. Uh, or you can reduce to this case. Uh, you have to throw away some bits first. Uh, is regular. OK, so that's sort of uh, it's exactly where excellence comes in, and it's sort of buried in here is that you really need to you apply Neuron, Neuron Bay applies Neuron Popescu at this point to get uh, the result, and that's how we get, that's where excellence comes into the Tanakh duality. Well, I'll stop there. I only would like to know, since in three you use only flat, yes? Yeah. This was the only thing which you need from uh, the theorem, not smooth, nothing, just flat? I think so, that's right. Well, but uh, maybe this flatness, you can get it in a very uh, general case. Well, um, I, I mean, it is... Uh, uh, very weak. Perhaps it's not necessary to have regular morphisms. Perhaps you can uh, apply uh, very uh, uh, some general theorem, well-known theorem. I don't know exactly in this moment, but uh, I think uh, only flat. It's very little, so yeah, you could I mean do I it in a different way. I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that would be interesting. I can just answer this question that already in Moribay's paper, there's a comment that there are cases where you can't write it as, an as a limit of flat, yeah. even in dimension one. I think even in dimension one, it's not possible. I mean, yeah. in general. Yeah. Yeah. So that's. Any more questions or comments? Well, let's thank uh, Jack again. <laughs> <laughs>